Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's virtual event, Taswell Thompson and Janine Tesori, in conversation with Rhonda Sewell, presented by Toledo Opera. My name is Alyssa Greenberg, and I'm the Community Engagement Director at Toledo Opera. As many tuning in tonight might already know, Toledo Opera will present Taswell and Janine's award-winning opera, Blue, at the Valentine Theater on August 26th and 28th, 2022. This production was originally scheduled for this month, but was postponed due to COVID-19. The silver lining of this postponement is that it allows us a few extra months to organize community events, and tonight's event will be the first of many. Taswell, who wrote the, the libretto for Blue, describes the opera as follows, quote, Blue is the story of an African-American couple in Harlem filled with hope and fear for their activist teenage son. The mother worries for his future, the father, while preparing his son for the realities of 21st century America, wrestles with his own identity, a black man in blue, unquote. Blue was awarded the prize for best new opera by the Music Critics Association of North America in 2020. Tonight, at the beginning of Black History Month, it is a special honor for us to be joined by the artists who co-created this compelling and timely opera. Before we begin the event, Toledo Opera wishes to thank our Community Engagement Advisory Committee members, Matthew Ahn, Bhuneshwar Arjun, Laurel Capellas, Felisa Clark, Zara Aprili Collins, Sarah Dastiger, Norris Finley, Ashley Futrell, Crystal Glambin, Patty Hernandez, Brittany Jones, Tanasio Loudermill, Mayling Ruiz, Quinlan Tyler, Ebony Waweru, Sierra Webb, and Ron Wells Jr. We also wish to thank the entire Toledo Opera team, Suzanne Rorick, Lovey Aldinger, Rachel Cameron, Jim Norman, Kevin Bilsma, Shar Robeson, Melissa Weirman, Luke Serrano, Candace Harrison, Stephanie Elson, and resident artists Andrew Payne, Catherine Kincaid, Fran Danielle Lafarica, Mercy Olson, and Grace Whipsley. We also want to thank our entire Toledo Opera Board of Trustees for their leadership, our Humanities Advisor, Dr. Naomi Andre, and our generous supporters, Ohio Humanities, Owens Corning, and the National Endowment for the Arts. I know that August probably feels like a long way away, especially those of us who are looking out their windows at a literal blizzard. So to encourage you to make your plans to attend early, we are holding a flash sale for individual tickets for Blue. Tomorrow is the final day to receive a 15% discount for individual tickets. This offer is available by phone only and you can reach our office tomorrow between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. at 419-255-SING. At Toledo Opera, we take every opportunity to share the magic of opera with you at our events. This evening, we will stream a piece performed by the blue casts of the Glimmerglass Festival and Washington National Opera. This piece was led by mezzo-soprano Brianna Hunter and bass Kenneth Kellogg and supported by the Glimmerglass Festival. This poignant performance of the talk and lay my burden down from blue honors the pain of a long list of victims and calls for a just safer world for black lives. Kenneth Kellogg in the role of the father and Gordon Hawkins in the role of the reverend performed in the original Glimmerglass cast and will be joining us in Toledo in August. In fact, this is breaking news. We literally just signed the paperwork with Kenneth Kellogg yesterday and updated our website today. Thank you to Glimmerglass for permitting us to stream this piece tonight. This piece concludes with a list of organizations working for racial justice that Glimmerglass suggests you support. And to that list, we would add local groups, including the Community Solidarity Response Network and the NAACP Toledo branch. And now we present Blue in Memoriam. Stay alive. That's what you supposed to do. You a black boy. A walking, moving target. A black boy. Take off the hoodie. The hoodie. 
the hoodie, 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 the light is turning amber. Run. Run across the street. No, don't run. Walk. Don't walk. Don't walk. Walk. Don't. Don't wear your ball cap backwards. Don't wear a hoodie. Don't carry shiny objects. Don't get a tattoo. Don't pierce your ears. Don't shave your head. Don't get an afro. Don't make a fist. Don't sit on the curb. Don't sit on the hood of the car. Don't wear cornrows. Don't look the man in the eye. Look the man in the eye. Don't make quick movements. Don't put your hands in your pockets. Don't remove your shirt. Don't lie on the grass. Don't wear sunglasses. Don't spit. Don't chew. Don't laugh. Don't bounce. Have a photo ID. Have a driver's license. Social security card. Voter registration. A passport. Dog tag. Library card. Don't run. Don't, Don't run. run. Don't, Don't run. run. Don't. You are black. We sing Christ wore the crown of thorns. Christ wore the crown of thorns. Christ wore the crown of thorns. Christ and
Blue was presented in Detroit in September and will be performed in Seattle, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Washington, D.C., and Minneapolis, in addition to Toledo. Each production will land differently in each city, depending on the lived experiences of the city's residents. For Toledo Opera, it was important for us to situate Blue in the context of local stories. In partnership with Madhouse and guided by members of our advisory committee and our partners at Issue Box Theater and the Arts Commission, we created a documentary film called Blue, Stories from Toledo, that interviews local Toledoans about their lived experiences and places those stories in dialogue with the experts on the opera Blue. Three of the eight Toledoans we interviewed are retired law enforcement, including retired Lieutenant Dr. Shirley Green and retired Sergeant Anita Madison. And through these conversations, the partnership between the African-American Police League and Toledo Opera developed. Tonight, we will air two excerpts of the film, featuring James Dickerson and opera scholar Dr. Naomi Andre and retired Lieutenant Dr. Shirley Green and Taswell Thompson. If you would like to experience the entire film, please join us for the premiere on Wednesday, February 23rd at 6 p.m. for a screening and panel discussion held virtually and also at Mott Branch Library. Thank you to the entire Madhouse team for your collaboration on this project. Rob Seifert, Molly Lutke, Steve Ludwig, Rob Wagner, Amir, Amara Burhan, Josh Coleman, Joel Helmick, Jake Rieslar, and Isaiah Suko. And thank you to all of the storytellers who shared their experiences in our documentary film. Dr. Naomi Andre, James Dickerson, Dr. Shirley Green, Crystal Harris, Sarai Pratt, David Ross, Taswell Thompson, Anita Madison, Tanasio Laudermill, and Dr. Marvin Whitfield. And now we present Blue, Stories from Toledo. Dickerson. Um, I am a photographer. I walk around Toledo. I meet, you know, tons of people. I talk to them wherever I can because I want to preserve those things and I want to document the black and brown experience here. You know, a few of us went out because we just had lost like a family member, but we were in there for literally 35 minutes and a fight broke out. My Girlfriend at the time actually called the police. Um, there's this natural response when you see, you know, a group of black people or black people and Mexicans in a parking lot and their instinct is so reactive. There was a tussle and I end up, you know, on the receiving end of taser of tasers. So I got tasered four times, two on each side, um, and eventually I had my arm broken. Um, I woke up, you know, asking for water. And, you know, it's like 3 a.m. at this time, and my parents luckily were there. And uh, several black folks had died in jail due to tasers. They tried to help me to, to go get some water because that's all I wanted, and I collapsed in the middle of this hallway from a heart attack. You know, my son at the time was only 30 days old. Um, so there's the threat of not being able to see him again. Um, that experience never improved. Um, after that, it became tough. It was tough for me to, for the next 10 years or so, I would not go out anywhere. You couldn't catch me anywhere in Toledo. So that to constantly have to walk around with that fear that there is something um, that I may be doing, even if it's totally innocent, just walking. Operas started telling black stories in new ways. Blue, when it was just being written, is just about a, a middle class family. The setting of the opera is contemporary right now. And it's really, um, th there's a feeling of 
It's not always so friendly for young black boys, especially as they get older. And at the heart of the opera, there's let's grapple with what do we do with so many black young men, and there are also black women who are being um, profiled and who end up dying not from anything that they've done on their own. How do we handle this? For those of you who are brand new to opera, this is an opera I'd say come to. This, Regardless of your age or your identity, you see these characters Characters who feel like people you might just encounter in your life. You probably know a lot of these people and they're all black and it's amazing. It's wonderful. I'd never seen that on the stage as a black woman. I didn't realize what I had been missing. This is an opera to come to because it is right about now. Blue is the story of a family tragedy and a national reckoning. Presented by Toledo Opera at the Valentine Theater. Tickets available by phone at 419-255-SING and online at ToledoOpera.org. retired police officer. I was a police officer with the city of Toledo for 26 years. I have a picture of my dad in my living room at home and it's in his rookie uniform. It's his rookie police picture and looking at some of the things that have occurred over the last years involving police officers and particularly black men, um, I think to myself what would he think right now? Um, all the work that they did, you know, himself working the street, and as a member of the African American Police League, what would he think about going backwards like we are? And how do we fix that? He would think we need to figure out a way to recruit and hire more officers of color because those numbers have gone down. The work that officers of color do within police departments and out in their community is very, very important. Officers of color, black police officers, they have which is sad, but it seems sometimes they have this additional burden to be this liaison between their police agency and the community that they came from. Um, I think having said that, if you talk to African American police officers, they can probably give you some pretty good ideas of how to fix things because they see it from both sides. And if if anything comes out of this, I think that's important that to talk to African-American police officers and ask them, what do you think? What do you think we can do? Blue is an opera about a middle-class family living in Harlem, African-American. The father in the family is a, a police officer and they have a, a teenage son. And he's a political activist much to the nervousness of his mother and father. From the um, perspective of the teenage son, he's living with the enemy. Uh, he doesn't quite understand why he says, and he says it in the opera, how is it possible that I would have a father who is a police officer? He derides his father, that his father could actually wear what he considers a clown suit for the white man. The audiences will see these black police officers as human beings who hurt, who love, who cry, who care, who are courageous, who are responsible, who are fathers, who are very concerned, deeply concerned about how they are perceived throughout the community. To me, the story is about what happens, what fate befalls this African-American family living in Harlem, New York City, USA, at a time where um, black lives seem to be at a premium. And for this young man, this young teenage boy, he is a moving target in America, being an African-American boy. 
He is an endangered species. This family just wanted to have a life and watch their son become a man and that maybe their son will give them grandchildren or maybe not, but that this child needed to have a full life. How will they go on? How will they be able to face a day without their son? It's how the community comes together to support them through love and loss and grief and love and survival and love. Blue is the story of a family tragedy and a national reckoning. Presented by Toledo Opera at the Valentine Theater. Tickets available by phone at 419-255-SING and online at ToledoOpera.org. Finally, it is my honor to introduce this evening's moderator, the incomparable Rhonda Sewell. She is well known throughout Toledo as a journalist, arts and culture professional, advocate, instructor, mentor, volunteer, board member, social media influencer, follow hashtag Rhonda has spoken and hashtag Rhonda roams the museum and community leader with a particular passion for the arts. Rhonda is currently the chair of the Board of Trustees for the Arts Commission and the Director of Belonging and Community Engagement at the Toledo Museum of Art. Rhonda has an especially close relationship with Toledo Opera, having co-chaired our Community Steering Committee for our 2018 production of I Dream and guided us toward the current iteration of our Community Engagement Advisory Committee. Thank you, Rhonda, for your thought leadership, advocacy, generosity, and guidance tonight and always and we are beyond thrilled that you have accepted our invitation to moderate tonight's event. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I am so moved by that warm introduction and I can join the entire community in saying we are very honored to have the Toledo Opera um, one of the key anchor institutions in our community. And I am so moved by Blue Stories from Toledo um, and I wanna get right into our discussion, but first I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists tonight. Uh, Janine Tesori, I want to tell you a little bit about this amazing composer. She's a composer of musical theater, opera, television, and film. She won the Tony Award for Best Score with book writer and lyricist Lisa Cron for the musical Fun Home. Her other musicals are too many to mention, including Blue, also Shrek the Musical, Caroline or Change, and many other, including Soft Power. Uh, Fun Home is a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Drama. She's also one of the first women to be commissioned by the Metropolitan Opera. What an honor. Ms. Tesori is the founding artistic director of New York City's Centers Encores Off Center series, supervising vocal producer of Steven Spielberg's West Side Story and lecturer in music at Yale University. We'll get into more of her background. Hi, Janine. Hi. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here, a Tony Award winner. So it's just an honor to have you here. Next, I'll get right into Taswell Thompson. We saw him just in the clip earlier. He's an internationally acclaimed director for opera and theater, an award-winning playwright. He's a teacher, an actor. He is the newly appointed director of opera studies at Manhattan School of Music. His opera Blue with composer Janine Tesori won the 2020 MCANA Award for Best New Opera in North America. What an honor. He has so many accolades, um, but we'll get into all of them when he comes on. He was also chosen to rewrite the libretto and direct the premiere staging of Aaron Copeland's The Second Hurricane as part of New York statewide celebration of Copeland's 85th birthday. There's so many things that he's done. Um, his production of Porky and Bess, one of my favorites, broadcast live from Lincoln Center, received an Emmy Award nomination for Best Director and Best Production. There's just so many accolades. Taswell Thompson, it's an honor. Thank Welcome. you. 
be here. Thank you. You know, you were going in and out of, um, and also Alyssa, I was having some problems. It became very um, staticky. Is that just me on my end? It might be, and we'll definitely have our background people to address that. I can hear you just fine, so hopefully you can hear me. No, I, I hear you, but every now and then I'm, I'm getting a static sound and I can't quite make it out, but I'm hearing okay. you now. Okay, we Thank will you. try to adjust with that. And let's just get right into our discussion and hopefully we can... Um, make sure that you hear everything because Taswell, your words are gonna be really important for us and our audience which who is live right now. So uh, Janine and Taswell, I want to immediately, before we get into more of the journey of Blue and the synopsis, can we go back to the local story, Blue Stories from Toledo? You heard from, uh, it was so interesting, Dr. Shirley Green, an actual um, and very noted police officer who comes from a line. Um, her father was a police officer and she followed in his footsteps, almost like the father in blue, who's also a police officer. You heard from um, a very noted artist here, James Dickerson, who in that interview, I could almost feel uh, the trauma, like he was being triggered again um, because he was even short of breath, even describing that experience. I think many people in Toledo know him well, know his artistry and his photography, but they don't know that story. I didn't know that story and I worked with him for many years. So, um, and many, I think black men especially uh, have similar stories of, of that type of trauma or unfortunate interaction um, with police. Can you give me a little bit of your just immediate reactions in watching that local uh, film? Who are you speaking to? Taswell, we can start with you. Okay. Um, it, it was painful to listen to, but not unfamiliar. And that's the tragedy of it, is that it is very familiar. And I have stories like that of my own, not as harrowing. I was never tased. I never suffered a heart attack as a result of being tased, and I was never locked up. But I was very close to having something desperate happen with my life when um, a police officer put his hand on to the holster that was holding his gun. I was returning from a, a jazz concert at Lincoln Center. And I was taking the, if you know, New York City, the Columbus Circle subway. And there were a lot of intersecting lines. And since it was the end of the concert, there was a lot of people coming down the steps through the turnstile and there's all these different connections. So it was a fairly crowded, um, uh, subway uh, system at that time, and it was at night. And um, suddenly I had a group of six police officers surrounding me, and they asked me to go up against the wall. And I have a little bag that I carry that has a book or my pads or passport. I actually do carry a passport with me all the time. And, you know, just things. And um, they started questioning me and, you know, where are you going? Why are you here? It went on for quite some time. And of course, a crowd gathered, a huge crowd gathered. And one of the police officers who was questioning me had his hand on his gun that was in his holster. And he approached me. He, he was closer to me. And um, they said, uh, we'd like to see some identification. I wasn't going to say, you know, why do I have to show you why I did it? I just started to reach for my identification. And I announced, I said, I'm going to get my passport out of my bag. I, you know, I have to tell them that, that I wasn't going to reach for anything. So I said, I'm getting now. I says, I'm getting my passport. And I says, um, don't be so smart. Just show us some identification. So I showed it. I was terrified. And um, so I opened up and I said, here. 
says, that's not good enough. I said, it's a passport. Don't you have a driver's license? I says, no, I don't try. How come you don't have a dress? It went on like that. Two other officers approached, one slightly older and with a brain said, what's going on? He says, well, here's, this is the guy, isn't it? He said, no, he looks nothing like the guy we're looking for. Nothing like him. So um, rather than saying, sorry, you can go on your way, from the guy who I thought had a brain said, as I started to walk away, you can go and stay out of trouble. That was the closing line. So when I hear, when I hear these stories from everywhere, um, now this man, this artist in Toledo, Ohio, it's painfully familiar and it's sad, it's tragic, it's divisive, it's scary, it's apartheid, it's racist. It's all kinds of things. And, you know, under the support and guidance and nurturing of my collaborator here, Janine Tesori, I could have written forever and ever and ever about certain scenes. And she helped me formulate what it's like to write for an opera. Because I had written plays. I've never written a libretto. And there were things that I really wanted to say and just get off my chest because of all the things that have happened to me. And that's only one incident that I told you about. I have several. And um, because of, um, because she is, she's written so many wonderful musicals and operas, um, she helped me abbreviate what I could write in 10 pages and 10 lines. She helped guide me there so that her beautiful music could enter in, which is the key of opera. And what I've noticed about being a director when I work, when I direct opera and theater is in theater, I wanna find the music. And in opera, I wanna find the drama. Hmm. And because I was working with a genius like Janine Tesori, I was able to find both the drama and the music in my words so that the real music could come in um, this is a long way of my saying when I watched that film. And I saw the whole documentary. Elisa sent me everything. And it's very moving and it's beautifully done. And um, I was happy to be a part of it. Um, it's a very important documentary. And it's, um, it's a wonderful idea that Toledo Opera had to, to do this documentary in conjunction with Blue. So I'll stop for now. <laughs> I said a lot. Oh, I'm glad you said a lot, Taz. Well, thank you for sharing the stories, especially the stories of, of police interactions that you've had, which are deeply personal. Yeah. Um, I said I have dozens. I literally. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, Janine, um, Taz well mentioned you often in, in his commentary and, you know, your bio is so long, all of the beautiful musicals, you're a Tony Award winner. Can you also react to uh, the stories from Toledo piece? Because Taswell touched on your composing and how you were so influential in guiding him to the story, because as, as he said, operas are very different from you know writing a play, um, but composing pain, composing mm -hmm. trauma, um, composing these deeply profound stories that even uh, Taswell had himself. Tell me a little bit about that and what you heard from the stories from Toledo piece, and then we'll get right into our, our main discussion. And it's very painful. Um, and what, what's, uh, what's very difficult is this is not my story. And it's completely my story because I live in these United States. So to abdicate a position or responsibility or participation is not the courageous thing to me. It's the idea that, um, you know, when I partnered with Taswell and we hit it off immediately, the ask of what Taswell was doing and my ask, we, they were very, very different. And I think it's the recognition of, of that 
Um, you know, Taswell, in asking Taswell to repeat this, this kind of experience, this lived experience, and asking him to communicate in poetry, in words, in our hundreds of hours of discussion, in my asking Taswell to read his own words, it's a reenactment of sorts of the, the very thing. Uh, this opera is not just about that. Of course, it's the things that are denied. It's about possibilities denied. So, you know, to cast the shadow, you have to have a lot of light. And one of the things that I do love about this piece is the extreme joy that you understand comes from an intact family and from seeing this family's love and devotion and loyalty of friendship and communion. And, and that's what's at stake and that's what gets lost. And so I think it had both. But my job, the assignment I think of a composer is to put into some abstraction what it is that the story is. And in this case, it's Taswell's deep, deep experience and try to conjure up what for me it would sound like. And so I live, it's almost like, well, Taswell is in a sense writing something and I am, I am acting it through this music. So there would be times when I would write those, the, the, the music that you heard, um, which occurs in the second act in the funeral. And I would have to be, I would have to sit for hours to recover. And that's, that's an intellectual experience. That is not something, I mean, I grew up in a house that had a lot of danger in it, but it was within my household. It wasn't, I don't go out onto the streets and, 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 and carry with me um, that, uh, that I, do. I don't, I don't have that. And so it's for me, approximating it, illuminating it, doing the best I can with what I have that to be in service of um, um, this story. And also, you know, to provide something that people can be with. You can't take an evening that is relentless. You have to guide a, an audience through their ears and through their hearts and their souls, their imagination through a story. So they feel like they are this family and what happens to them there, uh, you know, that they're, they've also experienced that. That is that kind of investment that is theater, I think. You bear witness to something and you emerge in, onto the streets a little bit hopefully different than when you started. So well said. So well said, Janine. Thank you so much for the, that um, perspective. I love the whole concept of bearing witness uh, because through art, we're able to grow and to learn um, even with social injustices. And I think it may be new for an opera, but Taswell, I want to go right to you to ask, to, can you take uh, viewers tonight on the journey to Blue? How did you comprehend or think of this story? Was it your own personal stories that you uh, spoke to us about? And one of the fascinating things that I'm um, especially interested in is your connection to um, these wonderful black male writers such as you know Langston Hughes and Richard Wright and all of the kings of black literature that you were inspired by as well as the stories that we're more familiar with, especially over the last two years. But this has been a lifetime um, of, of pain. It's not just the last two years. But tell me about the journey to Blue. Yes, um, well, my hero is James Baldwin. And I've read everything of James Baldwin. I read it at a very early age. Um, when I was a freshman in high school, I discovered another country and I thought, who is this? What's going on? It was so graphic and so lyrical and so strong and powerful. And um, I read it over again as soon as I finished reading it. And then of course, I grew up in a convent. So um, I was surrounded by beautiful music. Um, not only the music that I heard in church, I'm a Roman Catholic, and it was uh, St. Dominic's in Blower Belt, upstate New York. Um, but I had this wonderful nun who every Tuesday and Thursday, to Sister Benvenuta, 
would come in with her metal trolley that was filled with, as she kept, called it, long playing dreams. And they were all operas. And she taught us how to read music. And um, she would play these moments from opera. And so, and I was eight, nine years old at the time. And I'm listening to, you know, Caruso and Tobaldi and Leontine Price and Paul Robeson. It was great. And so it started there, the music and the poetry. And I just, I was surrounded by wonderful women who were nuns who introduced me to literature, especially poetry and music. And um, so my journey to loving the, the word, the spoken word, the, road, the word that's, that's on a page began there. And um, Sister Charles Williams, <laughs> taking advantage that, you know, I was one of the very few out of the hundreds of kids who were up there who was a, a black kid you know, in the Catholic Church, um, it's it's not what one would necessarily associate if you're writing about the church in a play or an opera. You usually might want to think of, of gospel. But I came to gospel much later in life. I was first introduced to Gregorian chants and liturgical music and opera, of all things. So my beginnings, my process, my learning curve started when I was a child through poetry, through Langston Hughes, through James Baldwin, that was, even though that was later. But the music was something that took a hold of me. And I loved what Janine just said about, you've got to touch the audiences through their ears and their hearts and then their imaginations. And that started for me very early on. So. Um, Coming to this particular story, um, at the time that it was, uh, that I was approached, and I was approached by Janine. Janine chose me to be her partner in this, to be the librettist. She was given the commission to write something about where we are in the country with um, social, political, racial problems. And after meeting her, we hit it off right away um, we both felt that we, we needed to say something about what was going on in the country. And at this time, it was 2019. I, no, it was earlier than that, actually. Much. The, the, yeah, it premiered in 2019. So it was maybe 2015 or something. Early with the commission. And it seemed that every month there was something about a police officer killing an unarmed black boy or man. I remember the Trayvon, Trayvon Martin and the, there's, I think it's the cover of New York Magazine today, I have it, where it's 20 years old, Trayvon Martin, he's on the cover. And, um, and there was just one thing, one person, Eric Garner and, um, and it just seemed never ending. So that was on my, certainly on my mind. And it, it touched me deeply. It worried me. It scared me. I remember during the Giuliani administration, I live in Harlem and coming home sometimes in Harlem. He had the stop and frisk um, policy. And sometimes I'd be a couple of doors down from where I lived and I was asked to stop and I was frisked to see if I had drugs or guns on me. And um, I remember one time someone, uh, this police officer turned me around and said, I'm gonna go into your pockets. Do you have anything sharp in there? Needles, said, do you have any needles in your pocket? So of course I had to respond to that somehow. And I tried to write a play, I remember, and I, it, nothing was happening. But I think when I met Janine and we started to talk about what we wanted, what this story should be. I knew it had to be about a family living in Harlem, that's where I live, and about a family, I come from a broken family, so it had to be a family that was idealized for me, what I would want my family to be like. And I used a part of me in it because um, 
in my own small way, I'm an activist. I'm certainly politically um, involved. Um, I, uh, I care and I feel about what's going on in the world, even more so now than ever, because it's, it's, we're living now in a very dangerous time, a very divisive time. And I fear for this country, I fear for what we're going. And so those feelings that I have now, I had then as well when I started to write the libretto, but I knew I wanted it to be a family. And I knew also that something was going to happen with the young boy in the family. And I didn't know how, but I knew it was going to involve the shooting of this boy or the killing of this boy by a police officer. The other thing that was a revelation to me is that the, the father in the family was not a police officer in the beginning at all. I didn't want to write about police officers at all. No. <laughs> um, in one of our meetings in my early drafts, um, Janine said, why don't you make him uh, a police officer? Because I had the father as a struggling saxophone player. And she rightly pointed out, she says, you know, we might know that story already. And she's right. We, we do kind of know that story of the black struggling musician. And I knew some of that story because that's what my father was, a saxophone player who never really made it big time. But, so I could write that. And I immediately said, no, absolutely not. I'm not gonna know, I don't wanna write about that. For the rest of the meeting, I kind of blacked out because it stayed with me. And before that meeting was over, I said, yes, it needs to be a police officer. Because I thought of all of the conflict that would arise from that, that the son, who was appalled that his father was a black man in blue, um, and what could come from that? how the father and the son might or might not get along. I interviewed black police officers in my community. I also interviewed a police officer, a black police officer in Washington, DC. And they helped me because I didn't, I didn't want to know and I didn't know any police officers, black or white. And um, so part of what I heard from them um, with their responses to the questions I asked about, what's it like to wear a uniform in a black community? What's it like to put on your uniform when you go to the police station and you're changing? And um, what do you put on last? Is it the holster and the gun? And they all said, no, it's, it's, the, uh, it's my cap. Um, so all of that, all of these little things were very helpful. One black police officer said that, you know, when he comes home at night, his daughter, his little girl runs and jumps into his arms and daddy, you're home. And his teenage son gets up, if he's watching television, if he's in the kitchen, wherever he is, he gets up, goes into his room and slams the door. Doesn't want to have anything to do with his, his father. So some of that is also in the opera. So the process was scary, dangerous, painful, fun, revealing, loving, discovery all over the place, learning new techniques, new skills, new crafts. Um, all of it was in the end so worth it because I felt in my way as an artist, I was contributing something to the stories that you'll see when you see this documentary. For instance, that artist, I mean, his story that we just saw, in my own way, I've contributed to telling a story that hopefully will be part of healing, or, but also more than that, that someone has recognized that it's a theme, it's an issue, it's a problem, it's a crisis that has no shelf life, that unfortunately will continue. And it's, we're having problems right now in um, New York City. I know Janine is aware of it because she lives here. 
We've had two police officers who were shot. A couple of months before that in my neighborhood, there were two teenagers, black teenagers, who were shot by two other teenagers. And then there was a retaliation from a gang. So gun violence is, has never gone away, but there's a surge of it right now. And it's very scary. Um, I would love to do another opera, but I'll only want to do it with Janine Tesori. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's on now. I'm, and I, you know, and the other thing is, I'm ready to write a musical. I want to do a musical now. I want to do something. What have I done? <laughs> I'm so it, sorry. Keep it going, Taz. There's medication for that. Take it. <laughs> I want to have some. I want to see a kick line. <laughs> there you go, Taz. Well, dream big. Come to my kitchen. <laughs> I'll do a kick line for you. Janine, okay. let's. So let's go straight into some of what Taswell said. I want to know more about your journey. I've read things about gigging in Nashville. I've read yeah. about Broadway. I, you know, and now we're sitting here with this Tony Award winning composer, and it's obvious uh, your influence um, and the collaborative work that you and Taswell did together to come to actualize this particular story. But I want to know a little bit about your own journey, Janine. Tell us about how you go from gigging in Nashville to where, where you are now. But I, you know, I, the, the thing about, um, for me, it's all about the the work. Anything past that, I, um, Taswell knows this story, but my, it, my mother was also raised in a convent in an orphanage. Uh, because her father uh, died when my mother was five and she and her three-year-old sister were separated from their brother for a while and sent to live in um, Pennsylvania and uh, to with to study and live with German nuns um, and he was a musician and he died pumping gas and I you know I'm, I'm very taken about the ancestral pull and the way that I talk about that with my students and I think about it, my sisters and my mother and um, the way that those, uh, you know, what, what he was not able to make manifest in his lifetime as a musician. I have his um, music stand and his baton and his, uh, some of his music. And so I definitely feel, feel that pull. And I think the, the, what what Taswell and I do, when you write a work, you parent it. So you make a work together and it looks like both of us because we're the mother and father of this work. And, and that collaboration has to do with a radical listening, a radical empathy. And, and when someone else has an impulse, the thing that I've always loved about Taswell from the moment I met him is if I would, I'm very passionate, I'm very stubborn, and like, I, uh, uh, uh. Um, because to me, it's the music I've been doing this since the age 19 and I've played piano starting at three, but I did not grow up, unlike Taswell, I did not grow up with opera. I, I grew up with a very, very eclectic background and then left music when I was in my teens because I was being pushed in a certain way towards classical music and I did not understand it at all. And I also didn't understand that you could do something in music besides sit at the piano and play. And, and I, I had no at all, I had no interest in that. And my teachers and I locked horns. I was a brat. And, and it's because I was, I was acting out only because I knew, and this is why I'm very interested when young people, they know what they want. I feel like they understand something by the time they're seven about what their dreams are and what they can do. You watch young musicians, I watch them all the time. They know it already. You have to get out of the way or you have to understand like those bowling things that you put up, put guardrails up. So they just don't go in the, the, go off to the side. You have to guide them. And so when I didn't have that and it was no one's fault, it's just that I was stubborn. I rediscovered music when I was 18. And then that was it for me. I just felt like, oh, I, I now under, I moved to New York. I, you know, I was, I studied here and and that was it. And every, I would say most of the days of my life were about fulfilling the mission that my grandfather didn't, couldn't do. And, and the way to illuminate stories that have not 
been in quotations worthy of being DFC, what I call DFC, which has down effing center. And so when we were talking about when Taswell said yes to bringing a police officer of color downstage, I, I was so uh, I was incredulous at the courage that that took, because that means, you know, fear does a lot of things. But fear, um, I just was watching these interviewer uh, interviews with the uh, Winter Olympians and they talk about fear and you can see it in their eyes. They talk about fear as their guiding light. It focuses them. It's necessary. It keeps them safe. And I have, I was so moved by that because there is that kind of fear. Like you see a bear coming, get out of the way. That's a different kind of fear. But this other fear is this guiding thing. And I think when Taswell took that on, he was saying yes to, uh, you, know, you know, grappling with trauma and inviting other people who have grappled with this trauma on to go with him. And I wanted to partner in him with that. So that meant when I was composing, I had to grapple with my own that had nothing to do with it, but was the closest that I could get to what it is like to fear for your life, which I have. And, and so we just move forward together and also to really experience, you know, Taswell's very funny. You have to, as my friend George Siebel says, if you bring them in for the pain, you've got to bring them in for the party. So you have to bring people in and serve them something uh, so that it's not just all this, this kind of the pain. It's not fair and it's not, it's not sustainable. And so if, for me, I'm, I'm such a student of the way that people behave, the choices that they make. You know, drama is besides conflict, it's about someone makes a choice. Some, there's an event, there's a choice, there's what they want to get and, and watching people maneuver in, in the world is, you know, I, I, I walk into mailboxes all the time because I'm just watching people and thinking, why did they do that? What are they at? You know, all of the, that stuff. And, and the thing that is so moving to me about the, the film that we were seeing is that is opera. We are just trying to organize it and bring it on the stage. It is not that opera is divorced or any theater is divorced from life. It is life. It's just organized and lit and sung. But you can see by that man, that artist, the way that his eyes went down as he was really, you can hear the music that he is being, his underlying, what they used to call the cantus firmus. It's the song underneath that's running through his life. And perhaps if he comes and sees this and recognizes something, he will have some kind of release of his burden, I hope. That's why we wrote it. Right, TT? That's exactly right. She's right, JT. <laughs> yes, the you. other thing too is, is watching. That, um, this journey for me was so unlike anything that I've ever done before. I, I write all the time. I've been writing since I was a child. I kept a journal, a little diary. I didn't know that it was a journal or a diary. I just would love to write words because I was influenced by the words that I had read in school. And then I knew this new language of, of uh, learning to read music. And, and then also I was an altar boy, so I could write in Latin and I could read in Latin. I didn't know how helpful that was going to be much later on in life when I started directing operas in other languages. But writing with someone else was all new to me. I, I write plays alone. I have an endless book that I've been writing on, writing for years alone. And, um, and I'm a loner. I mean, I grew up in, you know, in dorms with, uh, with 29 other boys for eight years of my life. And I was just surrounded by, you know, just lots of people. And, and then when, I, when I'm fortunate enough to work, I'm in a room sometimes with 10 people or 100 people directing them. So when I'm home, I don't want to do anything else. I just want to be home. And so then when this, this um, wonderful opportunity came along, I had a partner and I could do what I normally like to do, which is write and just keep writing and writing and writing and struggling to find the right word. But then I had to share it and I had to read it out loud, which was a wonderful process that Janine started. I would read it to her. 
so that she could hear it. And it would be, she wanted to hear it from me, although we did have a group of actors at one point when everything was finished, read it. But as she started to, to compose, she wanted to hear my voice. And I remember she never took a note, she just listened. And she would sometimes say, oh, read that page again. Oh, go back and start that and read it, read those three pages. And, or she would say, oh, hold on a minute. And then she just listened to herself. And then I'd go on and read it. That was a wonderful process. And I enjoyed it because two things. I, be, I knew I was learning how to work with a partner, but also it helped me to hear my words back because I, you know, I, when I'm writing, I will say my words out loud. But having someone next to me, I was hearing it through my ears and through her ears. And sometimes I knew as I was reading it, oh, I'm gonna change this later on, or this will be a little different, or I've written too much. And maybe that was Janine's way of showing me that I might have written too much because she would say, read that again. And it would go on and on and on and on. And so it was great. That process of, of collaborating with someone, it was so fortunate that I, it was with Janine. I mean, it could have been with someone else that wasn't as empathetic and caring and, and nurturing and fun to be with as well and loving. So that was, I was extraordinarily lucky. I've been very lucky with women in my life, my mother, my grandmother, the nuns, teachers. Um, and I would put Janine on that list as well. So that process of, of writing, rewriting a different draft, having to share it with Janine, having to go back and make changes through um, notes and observations that she made. It was a real great learning process for me. Thank you so much, Taswell, for sharing that. And Janine, what a, what a compliment. We do hold up half of the universe, right? More than half women do. So of course, these beautiful women surrounding you, Taswell, in your life is just wonderful. I also have to tell you, Taswell, when you come back to Toledo, that we have a very special relationship with James Baldwin. We have a neighboring university, Bowling Green, Ohio, which is a stone's throw from Toledo, Bowling Green State University. He was a frequent lecturer um, at Bowling Green State University, so much so that there is a room named after him there. And he had a deep relationship with some of the fathers um, of the ethnic studies department at BGSU. So we'll have to, uh, you know, get get some collaboration there when you come the next oh, time. I, I, oh, you must, must promise me that. I, I, I do. I, I, think I, I think I remember reading about his association and I forget that it's in Toledo. Yes, oh, yes. Make it happen. Alyssa Greenberg yes. was giving me a tour of museums and barbershops and things like that. But yes. I really, I really want to do that. Please. Okay, we it, it's done. It it, <laughs> it will happen. Um, you both talk about a universality of this entire message. Uh, Alyssa named in her welcoming remarks about all of the cities that Blue is being. Um, performed in, and I'm sure that we all can tell similar similar stories, right? I'm sure that audiences can um, see themselves in the family and the interaction, but they also can see themselves in the storyline and what happens in Blue. Um, there's a flow between the local stories that you heard. We've mentioned James Dickerson, the artist who was in the stories from Toledo several times. Um, and all of the national stories uh, that we've heard about, we're all very familiar with. Uh, Trayvon Martin's mother, Sabrina Fulton, has been to Toledo several times to talk to audiences and also to other mothers who have gone through the loss of, of their uh, children, mainly Black boys and men. Um, but I want to know, with that universal theme, um, that's carried on. Is is that something that you are seeing 
in the different cities? Are you seeing people telling you some of the same stories, the same storylines? Um, or is this something that is just unique, uh, you think, to larger cities like like Harlem, like, like a, a New York City? Um, or is this something that is more universal? Because I know here in Toledo, a medium-sized town, we have grappled also with uh, the loss of even, you know, really young uh, people, uh, the violence just in the neighborhoods alone, um, not just police interaction, but just violence among each other, gang warfare, things of that sort, as young as 14. Um, so tell me a little bit about, from both of your perspective, I think, Janine, we'll start with you, about um, sort of that universal theme that we're seeing in all of these uh, uh, cities that Blue is being performed in? Such a great um, question. I, you know, when we first did this, I, I'm, um, I do a lot of work with the Columbia Law School. I went there. I didn't go to law school, but I took some courses because I was really interested in the way that racial justice, reparation, and restorative justice could be, uh, as a composer, it, it's not just enough to take words and set notes. I don't, it's not enough, you know, for me, I want to understand something, the precision of something. I want to understand. I want to understand that. And we did a we did some round table, round tables there with people who would then tell their own stories. And it was quite moving. Um, it's being done in Amsterdam. Uh, it's being done uh, in the UK at um, at the ENO. And I had a I had a very painful conversation with the conductor who will be in Amsterdam and with some of the people in Amsterdam. And I said, I want to know how this applies here. And they they had, again, that, that same look, which is it applies all too well here and said some of the things that are happening there. And this wonderful conductor who's conducting it there is South African. And uh, you know he grapples with it in a different way. When he comes to this country he was in, I think he was in Philly and he was late. He was looking, buying something and, uh, running um, because he was late to his call and someone, someone yelled at him, don't run black man, don't run. And he said, he's never, he's thought about it every day since. Because, it, and, you know, it, it, and so we were just saying how no matter where, where you are, there you are, you bring that, you bring that with you. There is this incredible need to other each other. And for for the United States, I think it's a specific history, but the colonialism that has occurred in a global way, the immigrant situation, people are on the move because of climate change more now than ever before because of what is happening. They are displaced. Um, we have enslaved people who are displaced because we stole their lives from them and that we are responsible for that. And I feel like we are an ahistorical nation that wants to keep it moving because we move. Um, at the speed of light because we have to keep it, you, because life is hard here. And so I, I, I'm, I am amazed and saddened of how blue can be done and applied in every city that of people I've talked to. TT, have you found that too? I have, I definitely have. Um, I, I've received um, some letters that were uh, forwarded to me when uh, the opera premiered in Glimmerglass from uh, parents, a couple of teachers. Um, and because I worked at Glimmerglass Opera many times prior to Blue, I got to know some of the, the guild, the board and supporters. So they, they kind of knew me in quotes and they, you know, they sent me these letters, how they were affected by it. And uh, it has a small audiences of uh, of uh, people of color who come to this opera festival, but they came out for blue, and they were very shaken by the experience. And but black or white, I've had this this um, these letters that I have that are just so moving, and one looked like it was tear stained. It was so personal about what they felt. I also had some friends when I, I directed a couple of operas in, in, uh, in Michigan, Detroit Opera, and um, Blue was there. And I had some 
the same kind of reactions and responses. So it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's universal, unfortunately. And I've spoken to the director who's going to direct Blue in the UK, and I'll be directing it in the Netherlands. And I've spoken to the artistic and administrative staff there. And they say that this is not just an American story, unfortunately. They know that the prevalence of guns in our country and the, the, um, the injustice of uh, police officers getting away with so much of what happens to at the, at the opposite end of their guns to people of color um, that's extraordinary for them, but they say it's not an isolated story for them, that the rise in authoritarianism is now everywhere. But um, it's, it's sad that this is not an unfamiliar story, but it's also, um, I, I feel a sense of uh, pride and honor that I can offer this story as a release um, to those who come and see this opera, that they'll identify with the, the women in this story, or the father-to-be in the story, and the, then the father, the reverend, the, 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 the teenage boy in the story, the, the fellow police officers who get together to congratulate the new father in the bar while they're their attention is being drawn to the football games, all of that. You know, I, I, um, I'm glad that I was able to tap into that, um, and that there. So there are many things that an audience can, can hold on to, and if you are not black and you don't have this experience, you do have the experience of what it's like to be a part of a community, to be a part of a of a place of worship, to be a part of a family to be, you know, young, hopeful, bringing a child, bringing a life into the world, having your, your girlfriends surround you and who know you and celebrate with you and, and knows everything about you and can criticize you and yet love you and support you. And a group of, I like very much in this story to see how these four black men who are all fathers get together and they they know each other and they joke with each other and they they're proud of each other's that they are responsible caring and giving men and you know and that they also work in a in a in a profession where they're sometimes seen as the enemy even by their own people so you know we are a very complex country here and um hopefully that um there'll be other operas that can show uh, who we are and where we might be going and where, you know, and what hope there is for us as we move forward. And hopefully we will move forward towards the light, towards revelation, towards change. I love that Blue is documenting history as, as well. I um, want to encourage all of the viewers also to type in comments in the chat. I do want to leave some time, Janine and Tazwell, for our audience members to ask a few questions of you. Um, I would like to just uh, touch on, I think Tazwell, you touched on it. I was going to ask you next, who needs to come and see Blue? But it seems like everyone needs to come and see Blue. Everyone. And hopefully, I hope young people will see it. I hope that there's a group, a class or um, some organization that brings along young people to see it. And, um, you know, I, 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 came, I came home the other day after doing a little shopping and I have a wall that's filled with all kinds of books and everything. And I said to myself, I said, boy, it's a good thing I read my James Baldwin when I was young because Books are now the enemy. You know, books are being banned. And maybe someone will break into my apartment and, and arrest me for having books by Toni Morrison and books by James Baldwin and Langston Hughes and Shakespeare. Um, so uh, 
see blue while you can before it's, before it's banned because it's showing, you know, and we never have the white police officer on stage, but because it mentions it, it might make some people uncomfortable to see it. I'm laughing, but I'm also very serious. I think that everyone should see blue. It, yes, it has all of these, you know, traumatic events that, that are in the opera, but it's also very funny, very, very funny. Um, there's a lot of humor and, um, and there's, uh, there's a sense of reconciliation. I don't want to give too much away. That happens in the, at the end of act one. And there's, there's just other things that I think is going to, uh, that an audience is, no matter who they are, can share. That's so, that's a good thing, I think. Um, Janine, did you want to comment on who needs to see Blue as well? I think you touched on it earlier that you said, this may not necessarily be my particular story, but because you live in America, it is your story. You're impacted by it. Yeah. If you breathe this, you know, you just, I hope that this libretto is so fantastic. I think it's, you know, there are some, there are some works that are, it, it is America. And it's like, I feel like the patriotic, you know, I, I, I really resent when the, the, when the flag was co-opted and patriotism, patriotism is to reveal what your country is. Yes. And in, in order for it to move forward and soften and go forward with courage and love, that's what I feel. Um, you know, that's what, that's for me, what a true patriot does. Uh, out of love, otherwise we'd all bolt. Why would we stay here? We we stay here to confront what is confusing and complicated, and you do it. And in, in you know, it, uh, entertainment doesn't mean funny all the time. I think this opera is filled with joy, but I think it's you know the the story stands for a lot of 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 people. Um, I have found that if one person is sensing something it's probable that many 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 people are sensing that thing yes i want to go now if it's okay right into some of the questions and taswell and janine i am so um honored to tell you that the young um gentleman the artist the photographer james dickerson who was in the story is watching and he actually wanted to tell you that to thank both of you and thank you for putting this entire thing together for the Toledo Opera. And he says, I hope we're able to introduce this story and the opera to a new audience. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing that I do know about the Toledo Opera, Janine and Taswell, they have a night that they usually devote to students only. And I oh, remember cool. when I was uh, working with them with the I Dream um, opera about uh, Martin Luther King, we had 900 or so students for an evening. And I'm telling you, TikTok and Snapchat were blowing up about an opera. So, yes, so well, Toledo Opera has is. done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, James says hello to both of you. Well, hello. Well, I hello. would, when we're there, I would love to meet, yes, uh, and meet God him. Bless and I'm so moved emotional. when people, it takes a lot of courage. I do not do it. I do it behind eighth notes. But to <laughs> to do it like that, what he did, what Taswell did, what I, I just don't, I don't have that kind of courage. Is It's like I'm breaking a sweat thinking about it because mm -hmm. it's vulnerability, which is power. But, um, you know, I think, uh, here's the thing about opera. This is what I will say, and my kids all say it. The power of the human voice to soar above a hundred people, including the brass in an orchestra, it, it's like, it's one thing to hold a mic. I love mics, but when you are your own microphone and all you're doing is bouncing sound off of your rib cage and inside your noggin and you soar out, that is divine. That sends a message from the universe and through God out to people. Hmm. That to me is the power of opera. So sometimes I think young people are like, why do they sound like that? And they sound like that because that's how the sound travels outside. And you know, you see great gospel singers who can carry that far. 
but it is, it is, they are NFL. You could bounce off the diaphragm of an opera singer. I mean, they are, they are incredible athletes. When you yeah. see Kenneth at the end of a piece and he's just like, it's a workout what he does. They are astonishing people. And I'm hoping that young people, the more they get close up to opera to see themselves inside the epic nature of this story, the epic nature of these stories. It's, it's very, as you can tell, I get hot. <laughs> I love it. I love it, Janine. I just have to tell you another surprise. Kenneth Kellogg is actually watching. And he uh, says, hello, Blue family, to you uh, and to Taswell. I love so him. He's we watching right him. now. Oh, he is. He is. He is a stunt. This man, this man, our poster at Glimmer Glass, Kenneth knows that, is Kenneth's hands holding his baby. Mm. I mean, they, what happened to this cast was not just about what happened in the room. It was the ability and their their decisions to bring their lives in, into a room. That's very different. That the, the consequences of that are very, very, very different. And I, sure. I mean, we wrote it for him and Brianna. That's so, it's, it's, it's wonderful. He is a, our partner. Yes, for sure. I do have a question of when and where will Blue come to the UK? Oh, it's at ENO. I don't have these dates because I can barely leave the apartment with my pants on. So Taswell, it, it, I'm not quite sure. It's on the schedule though. Oh, it's going red. I hope you can uh, still do see. You know what, do you know what's in the UK, TT? I can tell you, um, I have to go to the other room, so keep talking. Okay, yeah. we will keep talking, but it will be um, shown in the UK as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, before we, when we were preparing for tonight's discussion, Alyssa and I had a very deep conversation um, about my cousin. She actually wrote a play about if Anne Frank and um, Emmett Till were alive and the conversation that the two of them will, would have together. So it's been shown at the Holocaust Museum and other places, but it brought up, um, uh, is there, I, I thought that Blue was gonna be shown possibly in Amsterdam as well. Is that yes. true? Okay. Yes. Okay, yeah, because when I was there, I visited sort of the Anne Frank house, of course. Yes, it will be but, in Amsterdam. Um, powerful, powerful. Uh, Play. I just think all of this is like a documentation of of our stories, our collective yeah. stories. Um, I love to read also Taswell and Gloria Naylor, who were the women of Brewster Place is one of my favorites. Yeah. And she always said, and it reminds me of Blue, to be militant about the validity of your story or or the or the yeah. validity of your truth. And Blue is a story of a black family, yes, but it's one that we can all identify with. Um, and the storyline is, is familiar to all of us, as, as both of you said earlier. Um, yeah. So um, Alyssa actually says something funny here about the humor in Blue. She said, I never thought I would hear the word, you know what, the D word, diarrhea, sung in an opera. That's what she says. I have uh, I no mean, idea what that area is. is in B flat and blue. I'm just okay. It's a B flat. I love it. <laughs> it's about the the men telling the father, the new father, that he's now in baby jail, and that wow. every night the the child will be crying, and they won't know why the child is crying. Um, it's going to be in the UK, April, May, of 2023. Okay. And in uh, the Netherlands in uh, September of, uh, of, of this year. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, another question we have is about the Black father um, who is a police officer and uh, really looking at even what Dr. Shirley Green in the stories from Toledo mentioned about, you know, just ask us, we see it from both sides. 
tell us about that whole process? The question is about that process of writing about this black father and composing music for you know that particular character. Well, that's a com composite of many people. Um, I was, when I was doing, this was what I think we started, gosh, I think Taswell and I met in 2013 or 14. And we started, um, I, I was part of a, a, a group, I still am part of a group at, at Columbia Law School. And one of the things was a convening that we did, people from all over in many communities. And there was one police commissioner, an African-American man, and he spoke about the blue line and his experience. And I, I you know, when I read a, many, many articles and spoke to him, and about the, that he said very early on, it is not about the training, it is about accountability. And the way that he has, he has felt within the, the force in the history of the history of the police force, as, as we all know, is a very, very complicated one. So it was, I was, I could hear the, and, and, and the benefits, that's why we, we, we set dental over and over because, you know, I've never, it benefits for a job as a musician, you never have benefits. And, and the, 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 you know, the, the security of it, the, 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 the pay was very real for his family. Um, the, all of the health insurance, including dental. I mean, dental was a big thing. And uh, that uh, I was, it was so very, very complicated. And I thought, oh, I've never, and, and this was before Taswell and I were, were working on it. I had never heard someone speak like that. And there was pride and there was regret and there was anger and there were, there were so many things wrapped up in it. But the thing that really stood out is I, I thought there was this recognition that no one was listening to this particular story of this African, African-American man in blue. And, and so when Taswell and I were talking about that, I thought you can embody the complication and the conflict when you are part of it. It's how I feel about the church. I am also was raised Roman Catholic. For me, the church is a problem and the solution at the same time. For me, as a Catholic, what I always rebelled against was this acceptance. And like what Angela Davis you know, would say, you know, that, that great quote about acceptance, about you know, what you can no longer tolerate. And, and yet the, the church would say like, just wait, it's all coming down the line. It's like, well, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that, that kind of inactivity for me. It was impossible. And so Taswell and I, were, we have many conversations about how when the father goes to the, goes to the reverend and, and says and looks for something and he's, he rejects the bromides and the, it, that in turn, means that the reverend himself has to look at the part and the participation of the church itself into this problem. And some of those lines that Taswell wrote, you just wanna weep without, it doesn't need music. I mean, you could read this libretto and, and honestly, you could sell tickets to it, but about like how many more, to saying to God, how many more men can you hold in your arms? How many more black men can you hold? And, and I was just, I mean, you know, this has been a joy to talk to both of you. Wonderful, wonderful, talented people. You are gifts to the world. We look upon you, as Mari Evans once said, and we are renewed um, by this story, by your gifts. Uh, you know, the libretto being a composer uh, to a powerful and poignant story that needs to be told. And what better way than through art and through an opera? And I just am so honored to have this conversation with you. I consider it a gift in my life to have a to be the moderator, to be asked by Toledo Opera to talk to both of you talented individuals. I want to also thank, before I hand it over to Alyssa Greenberg, thank all of the wonderful people who tuned in. Uh, apparently, there were a lot and a lot of special guests, and um, they they can see themselves uh, in this opera for sure. We are apologetic if we didn't get to every single question, but um, what a beautiful conversation. And it's just been an honor of mine. Thank you, Janine, and thank you, Taswell. What an honor. I can't wait to come to Toledo and I hope that Taswell and I can be in conversation with more people 
there oh, because that's the real that's the real to me that's the real work for sure work. it would and i'm i'm just so moved by what i've i've heard and what i've said and always listening to my brother taswell is he is my great my great gift my 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 world changed when i met taswell and you know hopefully i've returned some of the favor and we now and have a new nickname is tt 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm sorry, you were going to say something before I hand it off. I was just watching the other night um, this wonderful movie called, and I had read the book, and the movie is very good. It's called Passing. And oh, yeah. Janine, oh, right. yeah with Janine, is, Janine is passing. Oh, she's, my God. Really, she, she's really a sister. And she's just, we, she's, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, so I'm telling the world. I, okay, I, thank I really you. Once we She's were joking around and I, I announced our um, engagement and a lot of people sent us like, I think I got a bowl in the mail and I thought, oh my God, we can't joke about that. We are not <laughs> engaged. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. You know what? Let's get off before we get into trouble. I love it. I love it. Let's hand it off. Thank you, Janine. And thank, thank you. you. Well. Let's thank hand you. it over to Alyssa Greenberg. Alyssa. Uh, Alyssa, thank you. You have the mic. Oh, thank you all so much. This truly, truly was a gift. What an incredible conversation. It was amazing to hear the stories of your processes as an artist and to see in real time an unfolding connection among artists, to see you know, your relationship to the words of James Dickerson was really something moving to see that connection unfold in real time. And Taswell and Janine, we cannot wait to welcome you to, to Toledo. We cannot wait to curate all kinds of incredible Toledo experiences for you in August. So thank you so much to everyone who turned in tonight and to our incredible presenters, Janine Tesori, Taswell Thompson, and Rhonda Sewell. A huge thank you to our producer, Stephanie Elton, who navigated us so smoothly behind the scenes and didn't let the blizzard scramble our internet connection. Tomorrow is the final day of our flash sale, your last chance to save 15% for individual tickets for Blue. This offer is available by phone only and you can reach our office tomorrow between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. at 419-255-SING. Please join us again for our virtual screening of the entire documentary film, which will be on February 23rd, which is a Wednesday at 6 p.m. To learn more about that and other upcoming events, please follow Toledo Opera on Facebook Instagram and Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel. To sign up for our monthly newsletter, click on ToledoOpera.org and scroll to the bottom of the page. The recording of tonight's event will be available on our website, Facebook, and YouTube soon. Please feel free to share the link with anyone who may be interested. If you enjoyed this virtual event and would like to share your feedback with us, you can reach me at agreenberg at ToledoOpera.org. If you didn't RSVP for this event, but would like to complete our post-event survey tomorrow morning, please email Luke Serrano at lserrano at ToledoOpera.org. And again, thank you all so much for coming. And for those of you in the Toledo area, please stay safe in the blizzard. Have a great night, everybody.